How's it going, everybody? Fear the Beardo here, and ladies and gentlemen, all right, here is my part three Kenobi review. So similar to my first Kenobi video, I'm not going to do the spoiler-free stuff. We're just going to jump right into it, and we're going to start off with the positive takes that I can take away from this part three episode. First off, Darth Vader is good for me. That's my opinion. I think Darth Vader, it was interesting and fun to see. New Darth Vader stuff, his suit up after he gets out of his full body chamber bath, his suit up process, him, his castle on Mustafar. I enjoyed Darth Vader in this episode, especially later on in the episode when he went into the town and he was just pulling people out of buildings, snapping people's necks, walking through and just everybody was hiding because they were so fucking scared of Darth Vader. I enjoyed watching that aspect of Darth Vader and watching it all play out. I really did. Um, another positive is there was a line that Obi-Wan delivered to Leia in the very beginning of this episode. And she asked him how she asked him, how does it feel to have the force? Or how does it feel to use the force? And Obi-Wan responded with he said, are you afraid of the dark? He asked her if she's afraid of the dark. And she says, yes. He says, okay, when, when you're afraid of the dark and you're in the dark and then you turn the light on, how do you feel? And she said, safe. And he said, that's how it feels. And I thought that was very interesting. It, Obi-Wan always had a clever way of describing what the Force was and what the Force felt like. And I did think that that was a really clever, interesting way on how to describe how it feels to use the Force. Because when I think of what he said, and then when I imagine what it would feel like to use the Force, it makes sense. And I just thought that was a clever take. Um, Tala, the character that he uh, finds on this mining system planet um the ally that he's looking for she's disguised as an imperial captain in charge of this fleet of stormtroopers and it's a rebel and she was good she she didn't overact her acting was well done and she was helpful to the plot of this episode but we'll get to it a little bit later she might have been too helpful if you know what i'm saying um, there's another part on that mining planet when Obi-Wan, Leia, and Tala are hiding in this building with the, uh, with the droid Ned B. And I'm thinking, Ned B? That sounds familiar. Where have I heard Ned B before? How long do I have to wear this cheese and thing? Just one period. But I'm not even Irish. Just dance the leprechaun dance. The flirting zone forever. Wait a minute. You're a girl. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, Ned B, the droid who doesn't talk, he is very helpful towards Obi Wan and Tala. Uh, anyway, in that building, when they move the wall out and they go into the room behind the building that's like kind of hidden, um, Obi Wan discovers that there have been other Jedi, other Force users that have gone through in secrecy through this building that Tala has helped these Jedi who are being hunted uh, escape. And Tala confirms to Obi-Wan that they were not all Jedi. Some of them were younglings that have escaped, and they were just forced users, and that the Empire has been hunting not only Jedi, but hunting down force users. And immediately my brain, it clicked that they are totally... I would not be surprised if they try to do some kind of shoehorn or cameo with Cal Kestis from Jedi Fallen Order and the new confirmed 
Jedi Fallen Survivor, which is going to come out next year. Uh, would not be surprised because that Jedi Fallen Survivor game is supposed to take place five years after Jedi Fallen Order, and that Jedi Fallen Order was already five years after the events of Revenge of the Sith. So with Kenobi being ten years after Revenge of the Sith, and Jedi Fallen Survivor going to be ten years after Revenge of the Sith, it would make sense for Disney to include Cal Kestis in this show, and very much so them showing that bit in this episode of the Force users and the Jedi coming through this station where Tala and Ned B, the robot, help these Force users flee and go into hiding, will would not be surprised if Cal Kestis, in live action, shows up to reprise his role from the video games. Other than that, that is where the positives pretty much end. Getting into the negatives, let's just say this. I'll get this out of the way. We can no longer look at these Disney shows, whether it's Mandalorian, Boba Fett, and now Kenobi. We cannot consider these canon. There is too many lore-breaking, continuity-breaking errors as far as the plot and story goes where characters are not supposed to meet other characters at all until they meet them later on in the original trilogy. And I'm talking about Darth Vader and Obi-Wan's confrontation on this mining system. Just the whole time I was watching them fight... The whole time where Darth Vader was chasing down Obi-Wan and Obi-Wan was running away. The entire time I'm thinking, this breaks everything that George Lucas established in Star Wars in Episode 4. With Darth Vader confronting Obi-Wan and telling him, the last time we met, I was the learner and you were the master. And it's not like that anymore. Well, this completely breaks that fucking continuity. It doesn't make any sense why they would meet up, why they would fight. I was surprised to see that James Earl Jones did return to voice Darth Vader. I actually had to wait to the comments because I wasn't sure. Because there have been a few voice actors who have done bits in cartoons and in the video games of Darth Vader that have sounded very, very good as Darth Vader. So I wasn't totally sure if it was James Earl Jones while I was watching it. So I had to watch and wait through the credits to see that it was in fact James Earl Jones to come back to play Darth Vader. And he did a good job. I've actually heard him show his age and his voice more in previous bits of Star Wars media than in this. In this episode, he he honed it in. He locked it in. He really did sound like a young Darth Vader like he did from the original trilogy. Um, I enjoyed the Vader suit-up scene. I think that was unique. I always will... F I find it unique seeing Prime Vader. Prime Vader freshly... In his suit, um, still young enough to be in his prime, but he is Darth Vader and damaged and injured and has to go through all this process of being, being put in the suit and the special care he needs uh, to stay alive. But just the power, the power that Darth Vader has in this episode, I really did like. But I don't like the fact that they had them fight. And I was surprised that they did it in the third part. I'm surprised that they had them meet in the third part. Because now we have three more episodes. How many times are they going to fight? Probably just one more time. Probably in the last episode. Uh, they will fight. One of the other things is Leia nearly... Gets Obi no the whole problem the whole problem of this episode that Leia and Obi Wan were in again was because of Leia's ignorance. Obi Wan told her, "You do not speak. You are my daughter. I am your father. We're from Tall. We're visiting family or we're visiting friends." And at the first sign of civilization, this guy coming in on this car, on this. I don't know what you want to call it. It's like this transport vehicle. 
She goes, oh, hey, you know, I'm tired of fucking walking. You know, my legs are getting tired. What's up? This is me. This is my friend. Oh, I mean, my dad. And, uh, you know, we just need to get to this station so we can catch the fucking next plane out of here. And the guy just doesn't buy it. I did, di- uh, I did like the practical effects on this guy's get up, his nose, and the frillies on his nose. It looked good. It looked like uh, episode four for sure. Um, I like that. But Leia's just constantly getting these guys into a whole bunch of trouble. And then there was another part on this transport ship where they pick up some stormtroopers, and the stormtroopers are interrogating Obi Wan. And then Obi-Wan says, you know, I don't really have time for all these questions. And then the stormtrooper's like, oh, well, it's a long ride. But literally after Obi-Wan is done explaining himself, the stormtroopers knock on the uh, knock on the transport vehicle. And then they're like, all right, this is our stop. Let's get off. It's like, dude, literally just like a minute and a half ago, you said that it was going to be a long ride. And that Obi-Wan should tell you the story. And as soon as he's done with the story, it's like, oh, you know what? Actually, this is our stop. (laughs) That was corny. Uh, It didn't really make sense. It was just kind of odd. All right. Another positive thing that this episode, that there was less of the Inquisitor third sister of Reva. She didn't really stand out as... Super cringe, as she did in episode one and episode two, but maybe that's because she had less lines. One thing that I didn't get is when she first showed up at the dark side base on this water planet, right? Why were the stormtroopers getting out of her way and almost like saluting her? Like, in honor, like she's just this, like she was the emperor. Because you remember in episode 5 and in episode 6, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, when Darth Vader and when the Emperor show up on the Death Star, they just have a brigade of stormtroopers, single file, in line for Darth Vader and the Emperor to, you know, arriving. Why does Inquisitor third sister Reva get this kind of respect from stormtroopers that when they see an Inquisitor, because Inquisitor are just Jedi or former Jedi Padawans or younglings who have been recruited and turned to the dark side, they are not Sith, they're Inquisitor. Why are they getting this kind of respect that the stormtroopers stand in line? And wait for the Inquisitor to walk by. That was odd. I did not believe that level of superiority and seniority that the Inquisitors had. Or at least just that of of Reva had over the Stormtroopers. That didn't make sense. Also, when they were in the meeting room discussing when she was talking with the other Inquisitors and then the actors... (sighs) She did still kind of feel out of place. She fell out of place. And you can tell that the other actors were feeding off of what she was going to say. Almost like, how do I, how do I put this? It's almost like you've seen like uh, the YouTube videos of like celebrities going to work at like a fast food restaurant. Uh, like somebody going to work at Starbucks for a day or, or Snoop Dogg going to work at Kane's, just a celebrity who wants to work fast food for a day. And the employees kind of like know that the celebrity is a little out of place and might be fucking things up a little bit, but they're a celebrity and there's cameras everywhere. So the employees kind of have to like put a smile on their face and just kind of like go along with it and just kind of laugh about it. That's kind of how Rava feels amongst the other Inquisitors. It's almost like the other Inquisitors know that Rava is kind of like out of place, out of touch and kind of... But they kind of have to just put on a happy face and just say, you know, this is Rava's show. She's This is her 15 minutes in fame. Because we probably know that Rava's going to die by the end of this series, I imagine. So that's just the best way I can explain it as far as she does feel out of touch in her scenes with the other Inquisitors. Okay, here's another thing. What is up with Darth Vader and Rava just teleporting? Just not explained and not showing how they just got from point A to point B, just teleporting. So Darth Vader confronts Obi-Wan. 
Obi-Wan runs away, runs completely away to the other side. And then all of a sudden, Darth Vader is right back in front of him again. And he's saying, you can't hide from me, Obi-Wan. And it's like, how did you get there? How did you get there, bro? Because we know you ain't fucking running. How did you get there? But it doesn't, it, the, the show doesn't care or anything. And then that tunnel, the tunnel that Tala and Leia were going down to escape to get to the transport vehicle to get the hell off of that planet. Rava just has this funny feeling when she's going through this town and she's going through and checking the buildings. And then all of a sudden she goes, oh, this one building right here. I'm going to scope this one specific building out and move all the furniture around and try to find a hidden door. Well, of course she does because it, because it was the right building she needed to find, of course. So when she does and she goes down that tunnel, we don't see any kind of like split off like ways, different directions that you can go in this tunnel. It looked like just a straight shot down this tunnel. But all of a sudden, Rava has not only caught up, but passed up Leia, but she also had the time to murder the pilot that was supposed to save Leia and get her off of this planet. So Rava and Darth Vader can just teleport now. Not explained, bad writing, poor attention to detail. Why? 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 It just takes you out of it. It takes you out of it at least... Do something to show and build it up why or how she got in front of them. But it didn't do that. It's It was like they had a run time for this episode and they had to cut stuff back. Maybe there was uh, deleted scenes of her going a different route or fucking running a 40-yard dash, a fucking 4-2 just to get in front of Leia. Maybe. But that's about it. That's all I have to say about it. Episode 3 was better them part one and part two but that doesn't say much but we'll see we have three episodes left so anyways if you like this video give it a thumbs up i would really appreciate it share this video with a friend who you think would enjoy it subscribe to this channel if you're new and we'll talk to you again soon